How many of you have ever wished that you could just hit an undo button in life? Anybody with me? Come on. <laughs> kind of like, you know, your computer, your smartphone, you know, you make a mistake and you just control alt delete is gone. You're moving on. But that's just not life, right? Some of you can't take back the words that you spoke to your spouse this week or that look that you gave your child or maybe that finger that you threw up as somebody cut you off in traffic. <laughs> hey, I'm just being real in church today. Oh, we showing up cute today. Okay. We're not going to be real in church. Okay. Y'all got it figured out. I must be more like toothpaste. I do some stupid stuff in life. It comes out and I can't put it back in. Isn't this life? Don't we just wish sometimes we could hit the undo button? You know, a little do-over. Anybody like do-overs? Come on, anybody failed a test and your teacher said you can retake it? Thank you. Hallelujah, thank you. I wouldn't have passed school if it weren't for some do-overs. Is anybody with me? Some do-overs, do-overs. It's interesting, uh, this, this next week, uh, Jerrica and I will celebrate nine years of marriage. Come on. Can't believe how fast it's gone, and uh, just really grateful to be on the journey with her. But it's so funny because I'll never forget April 26, uh, 2014, when uh, I got on a knee and asked her to marry me. It was the morning of this particular uh, engagement, and I, I won't disclose the name because I want to protect them, but somebody sent me a text message the morning of saying, like, I'm so excited for you. Today is going to be amazing. You got this. It's going to be all good. And I was like so encouraged because what they were doing was sending me a text encouraging me to be bold and courageous as I get on a knee and ask this girl to marry me. I was so like, yes, this is awesome, until I saw that Jerrica was on the text message as well. See, this is what I'm talking about. This is when we want to hit the undo button. Is anybody with me today? Sometimes in life, we just need a do-over. We need a second chance. We need God to, to give us some grace. Here's what I've learned is God's grace really is the do-over in our life. Come on, man, is anybody thankful today for the grace of God that gives us second chances? And it's so interesting because sometimes when we read in the Old Testament, we have to understand a little bit of context here as we get into the book of Jeremiah. These are God's people. He chose them. Do you remember all the way back when he called Abraham? He said, I have called you. You are my people. My promise is on you. And for 900 years, God was patient with them. They would draw near, and then they would run away. And in this particular time, the nation of, of Judah was turning away from God, choosing false gods and idols and all these different things. Their hearts were really hard and stubborn towards the God that called them. They started to drift. I think so often that that we find ourselves in these kinds of places. And as we're reading the book of Jeremiah, you can't help but just admire his courage to step out and speak these really difficult words to try to help these people turn back to God. What we learn, because we have the whole scriptures and we know the end of the story, is that it didn't work. In 586 BC, God would have to pour out judgment through the nation of Babylon to take them into captivity for 70 years. And so when we read the Old Testament, we can't help but think judgment. And it's so easy to picture God as this God that's just ready to judge us, ready to take us out, ready to give up on us. But you gotta read the rest of the story because God loved you and I so much that he sent his one and only son and poured out judgment on him so that you and I would never need to be judged. Come on, this is the good news of the gospel. We can't miss the gospel in the book of Jeremiah. 
And I can't help but see the grace of God and the principle of God through this parable in Jeremiah chapter 18, the God of second chances. I see this picture of God's grace and God not being done with us yet. And as we look at this parable, I wanna talk about each object that we see in the parable for just a few moments because I think there's significance in the imagery, in the metaphor, in the picture. This is the beauty of God's word is all I needed to do this week was camp out on six verses and God was just taking me deeper and deeper and showing me more and more layers. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. So the first, the first image in this particular parable that I want to talk about is the potter. Somebody say the potter. The potter. The potter. I believe that the potter is a picture of God. Picture of God. When you think about the potter as it relates to making pottery, you can't help but think about the creator. God is our creator. The, the potter in this particular parable is a picture of God. And I believe that there's a picture here that God wants us to get because the picture of a potter with the clay is a picture of intimacy. We just sang songs about being in God's hand, like trusting him, being close to him. And I really believe that what God wants to speak to us through this particular text today is that God's intention all along was intimacy. Go ahead and write that down. God's intention is intimacy. See, our lives are not in the hand of an invisible force. God is a person. And the Bible reveals God as a very specific person in our lives. Listen to what Isaiah 64, 8 says. This is really powerful. It says this, yet you, Lord, are our father. Some of y'all just cringed. You heard the word father and something in you got triggered. Yet you, Lord, are a father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. I read this verse and it's so interesting that this picture of the parable that we're reading, the clay and the potter, is connected to the Lord being our father. Our father. He's your father. He's your father. And last night, I loved it, Jonathan sang The Table, which we've all heard that because we were probably at Christmas Eve, and it's such a powerful song about there's a seat for you at the table. And it's so interesting because last night I had the privilege of, of going to eat dinner um, with a couple individuals that are fathers. And one of, one of the fathers has recently stepped into a season of empty nesting. He's not experiencing that closeness with his children. And as he's sitting there describing the yearning in his heart for that intimacy, that closeness, I can just see the heart of God for his kids as I see an earthly dad that has this longing and desire to be close to his children. If you're a father, or even if you're a parent in this place, you know what I'm talking about. I experienced this this week. I was walking in to get my hair cut on Friday, I believe, and I was hanging with Judah, and Judah's quality, the way that he receives love is time. It's quality time, T-I-M-E. That's how he spells love. It's time. And there's just something that, that comes alive in me as I'm spending time with my children, and this is what God wants from us. He wants closeness. He wants intimacy. Is anybody with me today? This is the Father's heart. You can see here in this imagery of the, the potter having his hands on the clay, shaping it. Your clay, the clay is you. This is you. This is you and I. This is our life. And the potter is, is at work shaping us and molding us. And he wants to be close. He wants to have his hands on us. I think of a recent story that I read that, that inspired me. And this isn't a new story, but have you ever heard of Dick and Rick Hoyt? so inspired by these individuals, but Rick was born with cerebral palsy, facing the inability to walk and talk, and here's what doctors suggested to his parents. They said this, that you should, quote, put him away. 
However, the parents refused to accept this perspective. Now, here's a really beautiful, cool story. In high school, Rick discovered a five-mile charity run for a newly paralyzed teenager. Rick was determined to prove that life goes on beyond this, and so he went to his father, Dick, who was not a runner, and said, Dad, can we do this race together? Here's the beautiful thing is Dick said yes, because this is how a father responds. He wants to come alongside his son and go the journey with him. And next thing you know, they go do this race, and I love this. I don't want to mess up the quote, but listen to what Rick, his teenage boy, said After they finished that race that night, he said this. He said, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like my disability disappears. This is the Father's heart. When we're close and intimate with God, it's like everything else disappears. The pressures of this life, our shortcomings, our mistakes, when we are close to God, it's like the disability that sin has created in each of us disappears. Is anybody with me today? Now, I've got good news for us. I want you to see, I think they've got a picture of this, but together they would go on to complete 234 triathlons, 67 marathons, and six Ironmans. Their remarkable stories inspired millions to embrace this motto, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And when I hear this story, I can't help but think of our heavenly father wanting to go the journey with us, baby. This is who he is. He's a potter that wants to shape us. And I love how Jeremiah describes what he saw when he showed up. We need to catch this this morning. When he showed up, what does the text say? Does it say that the potter was taking a nap? Does it say that he was passed out drunk? Does it say that he was mad? No, here's what it says. Jeremiah says he found the potter working at his wheel. The potter was at work, and to me, this speaks to the responsibility and reliability of our heavenly father. This speaks to his commitment to you and I as his sons and daughters. Anybody thankful for that in here today? Now, I want to tell you today that that God has a plan for your life. He hasn't fallen asleep. He hasn't given up on you. And in the same way that that the potter has a plan as he molds and shapes the clay. He's got a plan for you, and that's why Jeremiah 29, 11 says that, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. He's got a plan for your life. And what I heard Jonathan say in worship, maybe you have felt let down by, by God. You felt let down. I wanna tell you it wasn't a letdown, it was a setup. He's not done with you yet. He's got a plan. He will repurpose your pain for his plan and his purposes for your life. You're never too far gone for God to intervene and show up. I showed up to my Thursday small group today, or last week, and I was talking with men in our group that were stuck in addiction, in bondage. I talked with another man that was ready to give up on his life. He was in a closet thinking about committing suicide. And yet now these guys are redeemed and restored and walking in the goodness and grace of God. If he can do it for them, he can do it for you. Come on, somebody praise God in this house. I think so many of us in this culture, we just, we have this warped view of who God is. We stop at he crushed it. We stop it, he crushed it. We can't leave here today without the revelation that he crushed it into a lump of clay again and started over. He started over. He's the God of again. He's the God of the do-over, divine do-overs. Is anybody thankful for the patience of God? He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's not done with you yet. And the imagery of the potter we need to get, I felt like as I was praying this week and thinking about this picture 
of God as creator, God as father, I started to think that there are some of you that haven't been able to experience God as father because you're taking your earthly experience with your earthly father and you're placing that face on your heavenly father and it's keeping distance in your relationship with your heavenly father. How many of you know that, man, in this life, there's the father of lies? And I felt like God woke me up out of my sleep just a couple mornings ago. And here's what I felt like he spoke to me is that the father of lies took your father out and deceived him, which created your experience, which is now how you relate and see your heavenly father. The cycle stops with you. Will you receive it today? The father is giving you a second chance. He's saying, come home. There's a seat at the table. Somebody say, there's a seat at the table. There's a seat at the table. The second imagery that, that I just want to point out in this text is the clay. The clay. You are the clay. You are the clay. Genesis 2-7, it says, then the Lord God formed the man from the what? The dust of the ground. All clay is, is dust mixed with water. And what's so interesting is, in and of itself, there's really not just a, there's not really a lot of value in this, is there? Like, that's why I brought this picture up here, because on one hand, this doesn't seem very useful, does it? I can't, I mean, it, at face value, it doesn't seem, at face value, it, at face value, at face value, it doesn't seem useful. Yeah, that was intentional. I was not stuttering. And then when we see this, this beautiful pot, what would you plant in this? It, 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 it looks useful. It looks like it can serve a purpose. You know, the most beautiful thing or the most, uh, I should say that the, the most important quality for clay is its ability to yield to the potter. Let that sink in for a second. It's its ability to yield to the potter. The, the only difference between these two things is yielding. Come on now, let that just minister to you today. And, and I just believe that in this place today that no matter where you're at, there's always more with the Lord. He's not done with us yet. And if you find yourself in this place today, listen, I want to apologize on behalf of the church because if we've, if we've said that, that you're, there's no purpose in you and, and we've casted judgment on you, I'm here to declare today that what, what, what man judges, God says that's potential. So some of you came in here today and you're like, well, I'm good. I'm not marred. I'm not. I'm not the clay. I can't really relate to that. I'm like the pot. Well, guess what? You're called to reach these kind of people. So what's your perspective of the clay that's marred? You're calling something poison. God is saying, that's my potential. 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 I mean, the language is so powerful in the New King James Version. It says, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. And the, the word marred means this, to impair the appearance of, to disfigure. And I felt like what God was saying is what has impaired our appearance is, is our sin. Like the nation of Judah, we turn to false gods and idols. We, we choose our stubborn ways rather than submitting to God's ways. And it's in, it's in this particular process that we, we settle for an impaired and disfigured life. Is that how you feel today? And I just believe that there are some of you that that's where you're at today if you're really honest, but you're saying or your spirit is saying that there's something different. You're not quite sure if you can believe it. But, but in a moment of faith, in a sliver of faith that's, that's rising up in you, you're saying, I want something different. I, I think I'm ready to yield. I want to tell us this today, that your ability to yield is connected to your willingness to, here it is, to obey. 
Your ability to yield is connected to your willingness to obey, and so here's how you yield through obedience. Write these five things down. Right away, no matter the cost, without guarantee of an outcome, even if it doesn't benefit us, and all of the way. Somebody say all of the way. All of the way. And so some of you, you feel marred right now, and it's because you've been walking in disobedience. You've been walking the way of the world, the path which is wide that leads to death, and God is inviting you onto the narrow path. There are some people in this room today that you walked in saved, you walked in believing in Jesus, but today you're gonna make him Lord of your life. You're gonna walk out of here and say, God, whatever you say goes. I'm done going through the motions. I'm done showing up to church and playing church. I want to put you on the throne of my heart. Jesus, I need you. We're clay. We got to yield. We got to let him mold us and shape us. And when we do this, we start to become more useful. And the beauty is, is God fills us up so we can pour out. Like, this thing's cool, but what's cooler is what fills it. PT, you're cool, but what fills you is much better. KB, I love you, dog, but let me just tell you what comes out of you, people in this world need. There are marriages that are being restored because of the God that is inside of you. Cap, you're a great communicator, but the God God that's in you wants to speak to the nations. Kyle, you're leading a whole gym. You're a pretty fit guy. You look pretty good on the outside, but the one that's in you is greater and stronger. The substance that fills us up is what it's all about. And the final final thing that I see in this this text, this imagery that I feel like I just don't want to push past is the wheel, and the wheel is life. Here's what I want to say about the wheel is It's the potter that determines the speed of the wheel, and it's the potter's hands that determine the pressure on the clay. Here's the thing. Life is the great exposer. And you never graduate past this. I was reaching out to my pastor last week. In this season, God has been giving me opportunities to go speak in the business space. And um, I know I'm called to this. Like, I know I'm called to, I'll never forget the first time I ever spoke, like, publicly. I didn't really want to do it, but after I walked away, I was like, man, that, God has created me for that. And so when I step into these environments, there's like half of my heart that's like, you're called, this is, this is, this is what you've been made for, like step into your purpose. And then there's that other half of your heart that's like, you don't belong here, you got nothing to say, like you might as well just go, go tell the guy that's running the event that you're a little bit sick and just go get in your car and take your ball and go home. And I'm sitting in this meeting and I have to follow a guy by the name of Ryan Leak who's just a world-renowned speaker. If anybody was at GLS, he just spoke and He's a great friend of mine, and it's so interesting because I'm there like, yes, man, he just has the room, and I'm sitting like midway in the back, and I'm literally facing all these thoughts like, why am I here? What am I doing? What's so interesting is I I learned something, and this is powerful, and I I just want to encourage us in this place because God is always molding and shaping us. We never graduate past this. And here's what I walked away from that experiencing learning is that it's in those moments that God will just expose us a little bit and you have a, you have a decision to make in those moments. You can either run from him or you can press into him. You can either believe the lie that the discomfort was meant to destroy you or you can believe that it's meant to develop you. Come on, there's a character that he's shaping on the inside of us. And I want to encourage us to lean into that, not run from it. God is always at work. And I had, I had to physically stand behind that stage and say, God, I'm choosing to step out of imposter syndrome and insecurity and into my God-given purpose. And it's so interesting how when we do that, he gives us the grace. It's almost as if 
We're in his hand and he's carrying us. And this is what I wanna declare to somebody in here today. You feel marred, you feel messed up, and you're trying to do it in your own strength. You can't do it. There is no effort in being carried. I just freed somebody in here today. You're trying to do, and God says it's already done. It's, it's time to, to trust him. He's the God of second chances. Is anybody grateful for it in this place today? Is anybody thankful for it? I've watched God carry my family in this past year. He is faithful. He's so faithful, and I wanna finish with this last scripture because I just want this word of God to speak to you, and I'm gonna go ahead and stand to your feet as I read this out. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 through 11. It says, all praise to God. This is Paul the apostle speaking to the church at Corinth. He said, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. Verse eight, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed, come on somebody, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, here it is, here's what we gotta catch today. We stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Today you're moving from self-sufficiency to dependency. You're getting back into the potter's hand so that he can go to work on your life. Do you want it today? Do you want it? Do you want it? 